to celebrate National Homeownership Month. It's actually the last event that we have planned this month. Um, before we go ahead and get started, I uh, just wanted, I have a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to take care of. First of all, to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Christine Hillock. I'm uh, the Community Development Specialist with the Office of Housing. Um, I am joined uh, in attendance are many other members of the Office of Housing team, um, you know, receiving this uh, training and information as well. And then also on the line, we have um, some of our nonprofit partners and um, members of the public who also are just joining us for this training. Um, wanted to let everyone know just a couple of things you see in the chat there uh, that I've put the link to the um, Office of Housing's website, which is loudon.gov forward slash housing. And then I'm also sharing on my screen uh, the contact information for the Office of Housing. There's our main phone number, uh, the email address if you need to reach out to any of us or have questions about our programs, and then some links to a couple of things there. Um, one of our programs, the Affordable Dwelling Unit. Um, then there's also an apartment, uh, the link to our apartment guide, um, which is a guide that we put out uh, every year that has all of the apartment communities in Loudoun County and lots of great information as far as average rents, amenities, types of units. Um, and we are just in the process right now of updating that and the new update should be available within a few weeks and will be posted at that link. And then the last link there is for the Unmet Housing Needs Strategic Plan. The county is in the process of developing uh, its first Unmet Housing Needs Strategic Plan. Uh, so you can uh, click through to that web page uh, for updates on the plan. Um, in the chat of the WebEx, I have also put a link for closed captioning. So if you would like to have captions for this event, uh, please go ahead and click on that link and it should come up in a, a separate browser for you to access the captions. And then just wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this uh, webinar. So um, we've already be begun the recording and we are planning to post the recording uh, online afterwards for anyone who was not able to attend today. And then uh, the very last housekeeping item is that we will be using the chat, the chat function uh, on the WebEx. There is a Q&A and a chat function. I'm not sure why there's both, but we will be using the chat function um, for questions and answers. We're going to go ahead and go through the whole presentation today. So if you do have a question, if you could um, jot, just jot down a note, and uh, then we will be taking those questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So those are our housekeeping items. And then um, I am pleased to present um, or to introduce our presenter for today. Uh, so we have with us today from Legal Services of Northern Virginia, Floor Salvador, uh, who is the housing chair uh, at Legal Services of Northern Virginia. Um, Floor um, practices in the areas of housing, consumer and elder law. And prior to becoming housing chair, she was the managing attorney of LSNV Loudoun Office. Uh, she was a presenter in the Virginia Continuing Legal Education session called the CARES Act and Relief for Your Clients. Um, and she presented on the newly enacted foreclosures and eviction laws. Ms. Salvador is bilingual in English and Spanish and gave an interview to Telemundo Channel 44 regarding housing laws. She is a graduate of the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law. And during her attendance, she was an editor for the Journal of Law, Philosophy and Culture, obtained a certificate of study from the Comparative and International Law Institute and received an award for student leadership. Uh, she was born in El Salvador and has lived most of her life in Virginia. Flora is an incredible resource and um, advocate and legal services is a critical community partner for us here in Loudoun County. Um, and the Office of Housing is very pleased to have her with, with us today uh, to present on the topic, topic of Fair Housing Act protections. Um, so welcome Flora and welcome everybody. I am going to stop sharing my screen, see if I can do this. And I'm gonna make Flora the presenter. Let's see. Good. Thank you, Chris. That was a very sweet <laughs> introduction. I appreciate it. Of course. All right, Flora, let's see. I think I've made you the presenter. Yes, you did. And okay. you should be able to share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, that looks good. Okay, let me know when you can see the presentation. You good? We're all set, yep. Okay, great, thanks. 
Um, I'm really grateful for all of you to be here, and I'm really excited because fair housing is um, a topic that's near and dear to our hearts here at LSNB. And so just a quick disclaimer, this is not legal advice, this is just legal information. For legal advice, we'd basically have to discuss one-on-one -on -one person's situations, and this isn't the appropriate forum because we wouldn't want to uh, waive confidentiality and things like that. Okay. It's not going forward. Let's try that again. There we are. Okay, so I just want to start with a brief history of the Federal Fair Housing Act laws. So, as you may be aware, during the 1960s, Black Americans were deprived of housing. They were being excluded from living in certain areas, mainly due to like discrimination, intimidation and even violence. And so this segregated black people to low income areas that mostly had poor quality housing. In his role as a civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized that this reality was a core component of racial injustice in the US and decided to take action. So from 1965 to 1966, Dr. King co-led the Chicago Freedom Movement a campaign which sought to challenge discrimination in employment, education, and housing in Chicago. And during this time, Chicago was actually one of the most segregated cities in the country. Black home seekers in the city and sur suburbs were barred from middle class and predominantly white neighborhoods, and they were pre prevented from seeking housing. So by organizing tenants' unions and sharing their demands with city government leaders, and marching through majority white neighborhoods, the Chicago Freedom Movement advocated for open housing, which was the right for black Americans to buy homes anywhere they wish. In approximately August of 1966, after about a year of campaigning and despite violence and opposition, the Chicago Freedom Movement achieved some important victories. Mainly, they, the Chicago Housing Authority agreed to build public housing in white middle class areas, and the Mortgage Bankers Association promised to stop discriminatory lending practices. But the most significant and far reaching outcome was the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. This act was signed into law one week after Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. So from 1966 to approximately 1967, Congress was regularly considering the Fair Housing Bill, but had failed to get enough majority for its passage until his death. Um, and since approximately 1966, these open housing marches in Chicago um, created a close association with Fair Housing and Dr. King. So when he passed away, that created enough of, of an impetus to um, pass this important legislation. And so I had hoped to be able to share this really great documentary. It's, it's called the Seven Days Documentary by the National Fair Housing Alliance. Um, however, for whatever reason, technology wouldn't let us today. But if you ever have a chance to look it up on YouTube, it's called the Seven Days Documentary, and it's a great overview on the history of Fair Housing Act. Okay, so what does the Fair Housing Act do? The code states that it is a policy of the US it provide it is a policy of the US to provide for fair housing throughout the US so basically it protects people from discrimination when renting or buying a home getting a mortgage seeking housing assistance or engaging in other housing related activities and it also mainly prohibits discrimination against a protected class who is protected or what classes are protected. So it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. And again, sorry, so these are the Federal Fair Housing Act laws. We'll go over the Virginia ones in a bit. Uh, they have actually more protections than the federal ones do. So what is covered? 
anything that is considered a dwelling. So that means any building structure or portion that's occupied or intended as a residence by one or more families, even any vacant land which is offered for sale or lease for the construction of any building. So examples of, could include single family houses, townhouses, apartments, condos, even student housing, college dorms, mobile homes, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities. Who is subject to Fair Housing Act? That is very expansive. It can include landlords, property owners, property managers, developers, real estate agents, mortgage lenders, homeowners associations, insurance providers, and basically others who are affecting housing opportunities. Now, there are some exemptions in limited circumstances. So for example, the act exempts owner occupied buildings with no more than four units, single family houses sold or rented by the owner without the use of a real estate agent, and housing operated by religious organizations unless membership is restricted on account of a protected class and private clubs that limit occupancy to its members. So one word of caution here is that a person, even though they're originally exempt, they can actually be, become liable if, for example, they post an ad that is discriminatory or hire a realtor or management company, folks can lose their exempt status. Okay, so this is an inexhaustible list of some prohibited activities in the sale or rental of a dwelling unit. So for example, it's Ill illegal to discriminate um, and take any of the following actions based on race, color, religion, sex, disability, family status, or national origin. So folks can't refuse to rent or sell housing, refuse to negotiate for housing, otherwise make housing unavailable. They can't set different terms and conditions for sale or rental of a dwelling. And so sometimes you might see that if, you know, someone who is a minority, let's say a black or Latino person wants to rent a unit and they're given one price and then the very next person that passes by wants to rent that same unit and let's say they're not in a protected class and they're given a lower rate on that same deal. So that would be discrimination. Um, they also can't provide a person different housing services or facilities based on these uh, protected statuses. They can't make, print, or publish notices or advertisements with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling unit that shows a preference, limitation, or discrimination. So I'm going to show a couple of examples of that in a bit, but basically the thing to be aware of is to not show like a preference for, for folks in that area. Uh, they can't also, for example, evict a tenant or a tenant's guest based on one of these protected classes as well. And so they can't harass a person, they can't fail or delay performance of maintenance or repairs because they're in a protected class. They can't limit certain privileges, like, for example, um, pool privileges. So let's pretend this person has a disability and they can't use the pool. Well, they can't limit that privilege to based on that disability. That would be discrimination. And so they also can discourage um, the purchase or rental of a dwelling unit. And basically, they can't deny access to membership in any multiple listing service or real estate brokers organization. So FHA prohibits also in mortgage lending. So it is illegal discrimination to do the following, to refuse to make a mortgage loan or provide other financial assistance for a dwelling, refuse to provide information regarding loans, impose different terms or conditions on a loan, such as different interest rate points or fees, discriminate in the appraisal of a dwelling, and condition the availability of a loan based on a person's response to harassment or refuse to purchase a loan. So actually, let me go back to that one. So there's actually an example um, that's recent, I think as of May 2021, 
An Indianapolis woman stated that her appraisal of her home was cut by more than half because of her race. She was a black woman, a black homeowner, and after she got two low offers on two separate appraisals, then she had her white male friend stand in during a third appraisal and made it look like he was actually the owner. That third appraisal actually garnered more than double the price that she had been presented. So this was on the news and it was recent and it's an example of how you can't discriminate in mortgage lending. Okay. And so another example, oh, I wasn't, okay, able to backspace. Okay, another example of this is on, for example, March 19th, HUD announced that it had approved a conciliation agreement between it and Wells Fargo. It had, so a customer claimed that the Wells Fargo had denied her loan after learning it was for a group home for persons with disabilities. So it looked like everything was matching up, the loan was going to go through, but then when they found out that it was actually to, for, to purchase a group home for persons with disabilities, they were denied. And a HUD spokesperson said, group homes for persons with disabilities are homes just like any other. And mortgages may not be denied because individuals with disabilities will be living there. And Wells Fargo agreed under this settlement to pay $125,000 to the woman and provide fair housing training for its employees, including home mortgage consultants, managers, and underwriters. And they agreed to ensure that its policies do not violate the Fair Housing Act. So these are just two recent examples, actually, of this year that occurred this year. So it's important to be aware of what you can and cannot do under fair housing. Fair Housing Act actually also prohibits harassment. So it makes it illegal to harass a person because of race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin. Among other things, this forbids sexual harassment. So that can so some examples of that type of sexual like, harassment can include quid pro quo. So, excuse me. This occurs when a housing provider requires a person to submit to an unwelcome request to engage in sexual conduct as a condition of obtaining or maintaining housing or housing related services. And so, for example, in that a landlord can't tell an applicant that he won't rent her an apartment unless she has sex with him. Or for example, some things we've been seeing recently since COVID is sometimes um, landlords will ask for sexual favors in exchange for unpaid rent. That is also a violation of Fair Housing Act. Uh, also like a property manager, for example, can evict a tenant after it, if she refuses um, his unwanted sexual advances that sort of thing. The second type of sexual harassment is just creating a hostile and hostile and uh, I can't speak hostile environment. And this occurs when a housing provider subjects a person to severe, pervasive and welcome sexual conduct that interferes with the sale, rental, availability, terms, conditions or privileges of housing or housing related services that include financing. So examples of this is if a landlord subjects a tenant to severe, pervasive, and welcome touching, kissing, or groping, a property manager makes severe, pervasive, unwelcome, lewd comments about a tenant's body. Or for example, maintenance man sends a tenant severe, pervasive, and unwelcome sexually suggestive texts and enters the apartment without invitation or permission. The Fair Housing Act also prohibits retaliation. So for example, it's illegal discrimination to threaten, coerce, intimidate, or interfere with anyone exercising a fair housing right or assisting others who exercise that right. So for example, if someone is filing a complaint with HUD um, because they believe they've been discriminated against and their friend is a witness, you know, you can't harass the friend because they're a witness and you can't harass or, or threaten retaliation against that person as well, sorry. And so um, 
Yeah, so you can't retaliate against the person who's filed or or anyone who is assisting in the Fair Housing investigation. That includes any witnesses who were there. Okay, so let's get into advertising. So as I explained before, the FHA prohibits ads indicating a preference. So specifically, it states it's unlawful to make, print, or publish, or cause to be made any statement or advertisement with the sale or rental of a dwelling that indicates a preference, a limitation, or discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, or an intention to make any preference, limitation, or discrimination. Now let me go back a bit. So the prohibition applies, for example, to publishers such as newspapers, directories, as well as to persons and entities who place real estate advertisement in newspapers or website. It also applies where the advertisement itself violates the act. So for example, if the property being advertised was exempt from Fair Housing Act, however, the ad itself is discriminatory, then it, it falls under the illegal discrimination and it loses, that property loses its exempt status. Okay. So some examples of these, of advertising that may violate the act include phrases such as, no children allowed which indicates discrimination based on the basis of familial status, or no wheelchairs, which indicates disability discrimination. So I actually found these advertisements on the internet. Um, so the left one actually I found was something that the DC housing office uses. It says, nice one bedroom near U Street, close to shops, American citizens preferred. So this would be an example of discrimination based on national origin or race. That is not acceptable. And the one on the right is actually one that I found on another legal aid website. And this was supposedly based off of a real advertisement they found. It says, um, street is a cozy small town home. Oh, sorry. Let's say Main Street. Main Street is a cozy small town home built at the turn of the century, which was renovated two years ago and is very fresh. Ideal for a single professional or a couple or a small family. And so the fact that it's showing a preference for either a single professional or a couple or a small family, the implication here is that they do not want a large family. They don't want children. And so this could also be discrimination based on familial status. You can, however, market for certain pro for protected statuses as long as you're not excluding other protected statuses. So, for example, you can advertise that a home is accessible for persons with disabilities. You can state that all families are welcome. You can highlight that you know there's playgrounds just around the corner, and you can actually advertise a property that is for seniors if the property meets housing for older persons act requirements and so that's one of these so that actually is provided so what that means is that the property itself must be a program that's provided under state or federal programs that that hud has determined or and um it's specifically to assist elderly persons as defined by the state or federal program so that could also be um, programs that are intended for persons who are 62 years or older or 52 years of age or older. Sorry, I think I said 52, I meant 55. So for example, this is a great example. It says, picture yourself at Northridge Cottages. Visit our newly constructed maintenance-free 55 plus community today. So this is actually okay because it falls under that exception that's intended for a community that's 55 years or older. So this would not violate the Fair Housing Act. Okay, so now let's switch gears and talk about Fair Housing Act and disabilities. A disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment 
which substantially limits one or more of such person's major life activities. Or there's a record of having such impairment, or the person is being regarded as having such an impairment. To avoid discrimination based on disability, housing providers must make reasonable accommodations and allow reasonable modifications that may be necessary to allow persons with disabilities to enjoy their housing. A reasonable accommodation is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, or practice that may be necessary for a person with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a, a dwelling, including public and common use spaces. So there needs, in order to permit a reasonable accommodation to occur, there needs to be an identifiable relationship or nexus between the accommodation and the disability. So there needs to be a connection there. So some examples of reasonable accommodations are um, allowing an assigned parking space for persons with a mobility impairment that might be closer to a ramp, for example, or assigning a lower mailbox for a person who uses a wheelchair. Let's say this apartment typically has a policy that says first come, first serve, and the um, tenants who come in later get higher mailboxes. And so they can make a change to that policy and assign a lower mailbox for someone who maybe came in later as a tenant, but who uses a wheelchair and would no, not have access to the mail unless they made that exception to the rule. Another really common one is, for example, permitting an assistance animal in a no pets building for a person who is deaf, blind, has seizures, or has a mental disability. And these are some examples I took right off the HUD website. So yeah, let's talk a little bit more about service or assistance animals. So landlords and property managers may not charge additional pet deposits, rent, or security deposit for an assistance animal. And that's pretty much because they're not considered a pet. They're considered um, a service animal. They also can't require uh, assistance animal to complete a training course to be allowed in the building. So sometimes you'll see on the internet something that says um, it, it's basically an ad for assistance animals. And if you complete this training, then you get the certificate. So landlords can't require that as a condition to be allowed um, to rent a unit in that building. However, the, and it's a little bit tricky because um, the unit or the property owner also has a legitimate interest in making sure others are safe. So for example, if this uh, service animal, let's pretend it's a dog, has had a history and has actually like, you know, tried to bite people or has shown aggressive behavior, then it's a possibility as um, as an accommodation, they might want um, to have that assistance animal complete a, a training course um, to try to ameliorate their aggressive behavior or just have them use a muzzle when they're out in, in public spaces. Also, animals, as I was saying, they must not pose a threat to others. And the tenants also need to follow pet safety rules such as putting a leash on a dog when they're outdoors and picking up after that dog. A reasonable modification is different where, as an accommodation because an accommodation is a change to a policy whereas a modification is a structural change that's actually made to the unit or common use areas that will allow a person with a disability full use and enjoyment of the dwelling. So some examples are, of these are, let's say, lowering a countertop for someone who uh, might be in a wheelchair or in, installing ramps into a building or lowering the entry threshold of a unit or also installing grab bars in a bathroom for someone who has mobility issues. So the procedure for this, it can be an oral or written request 
the person doesn't have to use the phrase reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification. And the provider may not inquire as to the nature of the disability unless it's not readily identifiable. And so if it's not visible, then this can be verified either the disability itself can be verified by the disabled person or the third party or a medical professional. And you only need to request a description of the needed accommodation modification and again, the connection between the need to their disability if it's not obvious to the eye. And so landlords have a duty, they can't actually share information about that person's disability to the third, to other third parties unless permitted specifically by the tenant. Oh, let me go back. And actually they also have a duty to respond uh, to the request promptly. It could be considered a denial or an improper denial of a reasonable accommodation or modification if the landlord or whoever is being requested just don't respond at all. And so there are certain instances when people can be denied an accommodation or a modification. So for example, if there is no nexus between the disability and the request, or if it poses an undue financial or and administrative burden on the provider. And the thing to focus there, it's an undue financial burden. So some financial burden is okay, can be absorbed, but if it's undue, and meaning substantially, then that would could be a reason to deny it as well. Or if the request fundamentally alters the provider's operations, or it poses a threat to health or safety of other residents. Okay, so Virginia Fair Housing. This is actually kind of interesting because we've had a lot of new laws uh, regarding the Virginia Fair Housing within uh, the last couple of years. So the protected classes in Virginia include all of the federal ones, but in addition, a couple of other ones. So it protected classes are race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, meaning having children under age 18 or being pregnant, and it also includes and, and disability, but it also includes elderliness, which is 55 or over, older. And starting as of July of last year, a tenant actually may not be discriminated based on source of funds, gender identity, sexual orientation, and their status as a veteran. So, for example, an example of sexual orientation discrimination is a refusal to rent to same-sex couples. Or gender identity discrimination is an ad stating transgendered persons need not apply. And so the Virginia laws follow very similarly the federal fair housing laws. It prohibits discriminatory practices based on those protected classes and doesn't allow folks to refuse to rent or sell based on those protected classes or discriminate um, based in their advertisements. And basically it's very, very similar to the federal housing. Now the exemptions though, in Virginia, it exempts landlords who own three or fewer single family homes. And it also exempts owners and landlords who live in one of the units of a dwelling with four or, four, four or fewer units. So what that means is you might have heard of like the Mrs. Murphy exception. What that means is, for example, if the owner, the landlord lives in one of the units, then they could also be exempt as long as the units are four or fewer. Okay, so let's talk about source of funds discrimination. This is one of the new ones, so it's actually really interesting. Um, so what that means is it's defined as any source that lawfully provides funds to or on behalf of a renter or buyer of housing, including any assistance, benefit, subsidy program, whether such program is administered by the government or a non-government entity. So that can actually include Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher, SSDI, SSI, Social Security Retirement, Child Support, Alimony, Veterans Benefits. 
So what this means is that someone cannot deny you the right to rent or purchase a property based on the source, based on the fact that you have, that you're receiving Section 8 housing choice voucher, or that you're using your Social Security retirement to pay for the home or the apartment, or that you're using veterans benefits. Some exceptions to this application are that the only, this only applies to owners with five or more rental units or more than 10% interest in five or more units. And this is actually also interesting. The law doesn't apply if the source of funds is not approved within 15 days of submitting the request for tenancy. So this is for Section 8 voucher holders. So this guidance was provided by DPOR. Basically, it, um, DPOR is the Department of Professional and Occupation Regulation. And so one of the things that they noticed is that, for example, um, in order for Section 8 to approve of the unit, then it could take a bit of time. And so they don't, they're not requiring the landlord to wait and, or hold that spot forever if it takes longer than 15 days to approve that tenancy or the unit. And it's important to note that the time on that starts on the date when a completed request for tenancy approval package is mailed or emailed. And the important thing to note about that is when it's complete. So if it's missing something, time clock doesn't start yet. And the approval occurs on the date the unit passes inspection. And the landlord must cooperate in good faith. And so they can't unreasonably delay in providing documentation. Otherwise, that is also, um, it's not good faith and it could be dis uh, considered discrimination. So some examples of this type of discrimination is you can't deny a rental unit to Section 8 housing choice voucher because of administrative burden. So we've been seeing a lot of folks saying, sorry, Section 8 voucher holders need not apply. Um, it's just too much stuff we have to go through. And they can't put out an ad that says Section 8 housing choice voucher recipients need not apply. What is not considered discrimination is, for example, asking about income on rental applications and verifying that income in a commercially reasonable manner because landlords and folks have a, a legitimate purpose or reason to want to make sure that the tenant can actually pay and it's a business related purpose and it's not based initially on discrimination. And so, for example, if they're asking for certain income criteria that, you know, the rent or the mortgage not be more than 30% of that person's income, then it needs to be a fair application of that income criteria across the board. And so for more, um, for more uh, assistance and guidance on this very new source of funds discrimination, folks can look at the Virginia Fair Housing Deport website and they issue this great guidance document that's really helpful. It provides a lot of like questions and answers and examples and explanations on how to apply the source of funds discrimination. And in Virginia, for example, um, the Fair Housing Act also prohibits discriminations against veterans in active military, naval, or air, air services who were discharged or released un or who were discharged or released under conditions other than dishonorable. So some examples of that could be, for example, refusing to rent a unit because an active military person may be deployed and may not tend to the garden. That's, you know, and, and this person just loves their garden and we want to make sure that it's in beautiful condition. Um, that's not a reason. It, that's not sufficient, you know, because veterans, military, they can hire, they can um, have someone else look over the, the garden. That's not a reason to deny someone housing. Um, for example, another example is a refusal to accept VASH. So VASH is at Section 8 for homeless veterans. And again, along with that, theme of refusing to accept Section 8 vouchers, you, it would be also considered discrimination to refuse to accept the Section 8 for homeless veterans. And also, it would be considered discriminatory if 
folks refuse to provide a reasonable accommodation, for example, allowing a service animal in the unit to assist a veteran with a post-traumatic stress disorder. Again, let's say they're looking to rent a unit in an apartment building that says no pets allowed. And so just flat out refusing to provide uh, a change in that policy it would be discriminatory. So types of discrimination. Um, I think the Fair Housing Act is actually kind of interesting because it doesn't allow folks to intentionally discriminate against any of those protected classes, but it also doesn't allow folks to unintentionally discriminate. And so you might have heard of the phrase, a disparate impact. And so what that means is that there could be a facially neutral, non-discriminatory policy, but it has a disproportionate adverse effect on members of a, of a protected class. So it has a disparate, imp a disparate impact on a protected class, and therefore, because it's discriminatory in that way, it's also not permitted or it's not acceptable. Um, the policy needs to serve a substantial legitimate purpose for the housing provider where there's no less discriminatory alternative in order to be permissible in this case. So an example of, of this that had that wasn't discrimination on its face and potentially like not even intentional, but it was discriminatory in the way it had an impact on a protected class is uh, Waples Mobile Home in Fairfax County. They were requiring social security numbers of their tenants and if they couldn't provide it, well, they were evicting them or refusing um, them to rent a lot there. And so this had a disparate impact on um, undocumented persons and in that area they were largely Latino so that was a disparate impact on race or national origin okay so I want to just talk a little bit more about some common examples and things that happen very often so for example criminal records there's some HUD guidance. They've published guidelines related to the use of a criminal background check. And these guidelines apply to all property managers and categories of multifamily housing. Within the guidance, HUD warns that in order to comply with fair housing, any owner, manager, or anyone that performs a criminal background check um, it, or in a way considers criminal history as part of their approval criteria needs to ensure that it has no disparate impact on individuals because of a particular based on a particular race, national origin, or other protected class. Okay, so here's an example. Is this a violation of a Fair Housing Act? So an applicant applied for a two-bedroom apartment and the background check revealed seven arrests. The applicant's request for the apartment was denied based on just the arrest record without looking into anything else. So I think this could also, this would be discriminatory in the sense that the arrest could be for something that's not related to the housing itself. There needs to be some sort of inquiry. It needs, there needs to be more information provided. There typically can't be a policy that's flat out saying like, if people have an arrest record, they're not allowed to have housing. And the reason for that is because oftentimes an arrest record could have a disparate impact on certain folks from um, certain races. You know, we've seen a lot going on in this country since the last year with George Floyd and things like that. And there's been a lot of statistics and studies showing that certain races may be arrested more often. And so that that would have a disparate impact. So there needs to be on a protected class based on their race. And so there needs to be more inquiry, more information digging and finding because landlords and property managers do have a duty to make sure that um, other folks and other tenants are going to be protected and safe, but just based on an arrest record, just like that, without knowing anything else, I think that that would be discriminatory. So for example, there's an ad that says, lower level studio, $1,400 available immediately, no pets, 
no criminal record. So as we said before, just a flat out no criminal record on its face could have a disparate impact on certain protected classes, either race or gender. For example, sometimes, and I'll get to it a little bit later, but sometimes persons who are survivors of d domestic violence, it's just, statistics show, are oftentimes women. And so if they're both being uh, arrested for um, a same incident of assault and, uh, assault and battery, the survivor of domestic violence as well as the perpetrator, well, then that has a disparate impact on a protected class based on gender. So again, you, um, you can't just have like a blanket, no criminal record. There needs to be more in-depth looking into that. And a third example is an applicant submitted an application for a one-bedroom apartment. A background check revealed two traffic tickets. The application was denied based on the traffic ticket. So again, I think that in this case, it, it, there's no relation to the home itself. What, what would that tell someone about the person's ability to um, be a good neighbor, to not vandalize the property. There's really no correlation between traffic tickets and renting an apartment. So that also would be discriminatory. Okay, so just going through some examples regarding family and familial status discrimination. And again, we discussed that being um, one or more individuals who are under the age of 18 living with a parent. So th think of kids. Whenever I think of this, I think of children. So example, lead paint. If a unit has not undergone lead hazard control treatments and it's available, and the family chooses to live in the unit, the housing provider needs to advise the family of the condition of the unit but may not decline to allow the family to occupy the unit because the family has children. So this is sort of a reverse discrimination. You're trying to help them. You don't want children exposed to lead. But if after having disclosed to them that there is lead in the property and they choose to live there anyways, then we cannot deny them access to uh, renting or purchasing that unit because of the presence of lead and because they have small children. Similarly, it would violate the Fair Housing Act for a housing provider to seek to terminate a tenancy of a family in a unit where lead-based paint has not been controlled against the family's wishes because of the presence of minor children in the household. So, for example, if they've asked for, like, remediation of the, le of the lead, and, and instead of remediating the lead and the paint, they say, ah, oh, let's just terminate the tenancy, let's evict them instead because it's just too high of a cost and the risk to children with lead is too great. That would also be discriminatory. Okay, so an example would be two-bedroom apartment available on May 1st. It's $1,800. It includes water, electricity, no pets, singles only apply. So again, like the prior ad, singles only apply, that implies that you can't have um, persons with children, right? Although singles could have children as well, but the implication there is families with children need not apply. Another example is a family with a three-year-old child is interested in renting a unit in Old Town. You propose three units to view and they but do not show an available unit that has lead based that has lead based hazards because the child will be residing in that unit you also folks have a duty to show all of the units equally and you know to the extent they need to disclose that this has you know this one unit has lead that that's what needs to occur. They can't just avoid or refrain from showing one unit because of the presence of lead. And so the way I think about that one is, is it's sort of paternalistic. Okay, so this happens also sometimes in our cases. And so I wanted to focus a little bit on domestic violence. 
So for example, as I said before, survivors of domestic and sexual violence often face housing discrimination because of violence committed against them. Sometimes they're arrested along with their perpetrators. So such discrimination can include being denied admission or being evicted from housing due to acts of violence committed against survivors. So while being a survivor of domestic violence, that's not a true protected class, women are, studies show that women are far more likely to be victims of DV. Therefore, discrimination against survivors may be discriminating on the basis of gender, which is a protected class. And again, that's under the disparate impact theory. So a policy that is neutral on its face in when it's actually applied, it has a disparate impact on a protected class. So let's go through some examples. So for example, John and Jane live in unit A. They are warned about the noise from their, they were warned about the noise from their apartment last month. Since the warning, there have been three noise complaints about unit A in the past week. Neighbors report that a male can be heard yelling and cursing. During one incident, the window was damaged. The police reported to the unit three times already. A notice of lease violations for noise and damage to the property was issued. John and Jane were both evicted. Then Jane submitted an application for an apartment on her own. During a rental reference check, the prospective landlord learned about the noise and the property damage, and the landlord said that Jane is likely to go back to John and he doesn't want this type of troubling trouble in his building, and then just denied her the rental application. So again, this could be discriminatory based on uh, gender because Jane, as being the survivor or the victim of DV in this case, she was trying to rent an apartment on her own, but based on an assumption that Jane would go back to her ex-boyfriend and, and she was just denied and um, she was denied uh, her ability to um, rent the unit. And so again, if, if folks do this all of the time, it would have a discriminatory impact on gender, in this case, Jane, because statistics show that women tend to be more likely to be survivors of domestic violence. Enforcement. Okay, so what happens if you you are a victim of discrimination? So under federal laws, folks can file a lawsuit within two years after the occurrence of the act. They can also file a complaint with HUD within one year of the act. Folks can call law enforcement if there's a crime involved. Um, so for example, if, if folks are being uh, asked for like uh, sexual favors in exchange for rent and things like that, definitely call the police. And if you're not sure whether there's a violation, definitely ask. There's a lot, lot of like um, information on the HUD website, DOJ website, the Attorney General's website. And so the Department of Justice is typically looking for pattern or practice of discrimination in housing, and they have authority to enforce dis um, uh, dis sorry to enforce um, the laws of fair housing. So the Department of Justice would typically elect or file um, an elected case and on behalf of the complaint. On, on behalf of the complainant. The complainant is a person who's complaining. And so the Department of Justice would basically be filing it on the behalf of the person, very much like Commonwealth's attorney is filing, um, is prosecuting a crime against someone who, can, who against the perpetrator, or the accused, the alleged accused. And they investigate other HUD referrals for possible enforcement actions. So um, they, and, and folks actually have an independent authority to initiate lawsuits as well. 
And so some of the things that they look into, the Department of Justice actually has a fair housing testing program that tries to see on its own whether people are complying with federal fair housing rules. So some of the remedies include injunctive relief, meaning that they promise to correct or prevent the behavior. So for example, going back to that example of Wells Fargo earlier this year, they promised to correct or prevent the behavior. They promised that they would have training. Um, it could also include monetary damages for victims and civil penalties, and we saw that as well. They were awarded $125,000 in damages or penalties. And folks can actually hire private attorneys to file a lawsuit in state or federal court based on a discriminatory practice. In Virginia, and the Fair Housing Board and Real Estate are author the Fair Housing and Real Estate Board are authorized to administer and enforce the Virginia Fair Housing Code. So the administrative arm of the board is the Virginia Fair Housing Office. And they have a website, and this is their email address and their phone number. And so typically what happens here when a complaint is filed is that the case goes to the real estate board or their fair housing board for a determination. And then the board reviews the file and they can consult with investigators and they can also consult with the attorney general's office. And then the board votes on a ruling as to whether there is a reasonable cause to believe whether a discriminatory housing practice occurred or is about to occur. And then one of the things that they can also do is attempt to uh, enter into like conciliation, which is sort of like a mediation process. If the conciliation fails, then the board will charge the case and the attorney general can litigate this in state court. Oops. And again, potential penalties are the same as in federal. They can include monetary damages, civil penalties, attorney's fees, injunctions, fair housing training, and so on. And so there is actually an Office of Human Rights in most of our counties, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William here. Um, for some reason, Loudoun does not have an Office of Human Rights. So any questions or allegations would go straight to uh, DPOR filing any complaints so that they can investigate directly. And here are some additional sources of information. The Equal Rights, the Equal Rights Center has great information online, DOJ, HUD, Americans with Disabilities Act on, um, on the government website is also helpful. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? I know that was a lot of information in a short period of time. Thank you so much, Floor. Yeah, excellent presentation. Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have already come in through the chat. So if anyone else has been saving up their questions for Floor, um, please go ahead and put those in. Um, and I will try to cover as many as we can in the next half an hour. We have until 1.30 planned today. Um, I actually, Floor, if I can ask a question first so that you can provide this information, can you let folks know, um, there were a lot of resources there at the end, um, what to do if people have a question about whether this is discrimination or not. Can you let folks know what services does Legal Services of Northern Virginia provide and how, how should people contact the, um, the organization? Yeah, sure. So legal services, legal services, we're a legal aid office. So we provide free legal advice and counsel to folks who are uh, low income, who are disabled, or who are elderly. And so if folks believe that they've had, they've been discriminated against, they can call our main intake number or apply online. 
and see if they can get a consultation and get legal advice on their situation as to what to do and things like that. And so um, that's sort of on an individual basis. But in general, legal, like our organization also provides and partners with a lot of like nonprofits and other stakeholders and county governments in the sense of like providing uh, presentations or information and things like that. So if there are any of those folks in the audience, like nonprofits or county governments uh, might have questions, they can also reach out to us directly as well and we can try our our best to maneuver through things with them. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to go ahead and just start asking the questions that are in the chat. And I think Floor said earlier, um, just as a reminder, this is a forum for general questions right now. So um, please don't, you know, um, share any personal information because we want to protect people's confidentiality. So, um, you know, if it is a, a question, um, uh, we're hoping that it'll be useful information to everybody who's participating. So, all right. So the first question here is actually specifically related to the HCV program. Um, you had uh, a, a piece on use of funds. Um, so the question is, uh, source of funds, sorry. Question related to source of funds. The HAP contract states that in the case of disagreement with the lease, the HAP contract supersedes. Can a landlord or apartment complex deny a voucher holder due to not agreeing with the HAP contract? This one's kind of specific, but yeah. Yeah, so this is more of a legal question. So typically not. So if the HAP contract supersedes, what happens is that federal law typically preempts, preempts state and, and lease. So for example, folks can't enter into an agreement that specifically goes against the federal law. And in this case, if it's saying that the HAP contract supersedes, then that's really what is the controlling law. Okay, great. Um, the next question just says, first, thank you for this uh, presentation, extremely thorough and comprehensive. And then the uh, question though related is, are rental communities and private landlords allowed to request a drug test from prospective tenants? So that's a really good question and that's an interesting one. I think that it would depend on the reasons, the reasons for the drug test, right? And so like, and how that's going to be used. So for example, just going back to that example for the Fairfax um, Waples mobile home, they were requesting social security numbers and it was discovered that that had no real relation or it wasn't really helpful in determining whether or not this person should rent mobile home or, or the lot itself. And so I guess the question that I would ask that person is like, think to yourself, like, why am I asking this? What is it for? Is it like, is it a, could there be a discriminatory impact in what I'm doing? Um, because remember, it's not just, even if you don't intend to be discriminatory, even if it has a discriminatory impact based on race, color, national origin, then it could be discriminatory also on its face. And so you have to weigh that as to, well, on the other hand, what's my substantial legitimate purpose for asking this? Is it, you know, is it a good indicator of whether this person will pay rent? So, yeah, so I guess it really depends on the reasons. And I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I could imagine some scenario, for example, like it's a group home for persons who are recovering from addictions and they need to be uh, clean or something like that within a certain time period um, because it could hurt, you know, other tenants or something like that in their recovery. Um, potentially something like that, but if it's basic just across the board, I would say be very careful, ask yourself why that's required or that's necessary. And if there could be, even though if it's facially neutral, you're not intending to discriminate, could this have a discriminatory impact on someone based on their race? or their color or their national origin. Great, thank you. 
Um, the next, uh, there's a kind of a set of questions that have come through. And um, did you call it the Mrs. Murphy uh, uh, yeah. rule or uh, situation? Okay, so this person says that this is in the context of the Mrs. Murphy situation, uh, renting some rooms in, in the landlord's house. Um, and the first question is, on the topic of uh, American citizens preferred being discrimination, can you require two forms of government ID provided by the U.S. government? So that's a good question. I think it depends. It, it, it provided by the U.S. government. I think it depends, right? Like, I think that landlords have a legitimate interest to make sure that they have some identification on file and they know like who you are and they're able to run your credit report. But I think the question would be, why would you need a second one? Um, yeah, so I mean, potentially, I think I would be wary of that, right? I think one, yeah, I think that typically, yeah, you can ask for at least one sort of a uh, legitimate form of government ID. And now actually Virginia laws have changed so that um, we are talking about undocumented folks not being able to get a, a driver's license or an ID. And now in Virginia, they can. So hopefully like that would be sufficient. Um, I would question a little bit the necessary, <laughs> why a second one would be necessary. And, and that could have a discriminatory impact on let's say an undocumented person who only has that one. <laughs> Mm hmm. OK. Um, again, this is kind of a series of questions, so sort of related to the same situation. Um, and let me just see. We haven't had a ton of other questions come in, so I will just go ahead and knock some of these out. Uh, the next one is uh, related to that same situation. Is this something I can indicate on the advertisement or the contract? I guess that's in reference to the ID requirements. Oh, to the ID? Um. I don't think it should be in an ad because you can envision someone who might not have that. They just won't apply, right? And so there could be a discriminatory impact on one of those folks. Or even just, can you imagine, for example, survivors of domestic violence that fled a really bad situation and they left everything behind? Like we've had that situation come in into legal aid and they don't have any ID, they don't have, they left it all behind it could have a discriminatory impact based on that gender or based on something else. So I don't think it would be a good idea to include that on the ad because it could um, have a chilling effect on certain protected classes from even applying. Okay, great. Um, again, sort of related. Um, if uh, there is a situation where there's a security clearance that might be negatively impacted, if I'm sharing a household or financial relationship uh, with foreign nationals from certain countries. Um, oh, and maybe that was the question. Is this something I can indicate on the advertisement or contract? But again, maybe you just answered that. Yeah. But do you have any thoughts about that? I'm not sure I understand the question. So the person has a security clearance and they're... And it says that might be negatively impacted if I'm sharing a household or financial relationship with foreign nationals from certain countries. And then the next question was, is this something I can indicate on the advertisement or contract? Oh, I see. Oh, so for example, they, it might be negatively affected by certain foreign nationals. So they wouldn't want certain foreign nationals to apply. I think, no, because that would have it, right? It might be. That, that's the question you're saying it, it and you're showing a preference for certain people who are not of a protected class so that could be discrimination based on national origin or race and you're showing a preference for those who are not within that that class so that could be discriminatory as well and it's based on it potential it could be right it's not necessarily yeah this will be negatively impacted so i think that that's that's not something that would typically, um, I would be careful with that. And I don't think that that would be allowed just off the cuff, my initial instinct. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, this next one is easy. Um, where is the legal services office located? Um, and I'm not sure if we already provided that, but uh, maybe, and are you doing, um, uh, can people come in for in-person services or, or should folks just call? Good question. 
So right now, uh, so we have offices in Alexandria, Fairfax, Prince William, Arlington, and we have allowed an office as well. It's on 8A South Street Southwest in Leesburg. It's a few blocks away from the courthouse. Um, however, <laughs> since COVID hit, we've all been working from home and we're slowly beginning to lift the restrictions. I think we said in September we should be, so currently we're not accepting walk-ins. So the way to apply for services is, is either by phone or online um, because we're currently not doing walk-ins. Potentially like in September when we're, folks start coming back into the office, we will start having walk-ins, but for now, best place is online or by phone. Great. Okay, we're getting more questions, so I'll, I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Uh, this one is, are emotional support animals protected in the same way as service slash disability animals? Also, uh, can it be specified no pets unless they are a service or disability animal on the advertisement? Okay, so yeah, in my mind, there's no real difference between an emotional support animal or service disability animal. So for example, um, if it, and it doesn't have to be like a dog or anything like that. We've had folks who have like a pet ferret and, and the ferret um, provides a certain comfort when the person starts feeling anxiety or something like that. And so they're still protected. They're as long as they are connected to that person's disability, there's a reason why they need that. They're not, they're not considered a pet and they do have that protection. Um, and so no pets unless it's a service. I, I think that ad is actually okay. Yeah. Great, I am uh, just putting in the chat right now the website for Legal Services of Northern Virginia where folks can get all that good information. Um, Thank you. And then I do, there is one more question that has come in. Um, let's see, this one says, running a rental application background check includes, that includes a credit check requires a social security number. So any applicant would need to provide a social security number. Is that right? That I'm not sure about. So I know different folks, for example, like CoreLogic, I think that there's places that can look it up with like your name and your address without a social security number. So for example, like I know of one of the legal search engines that actually does like a background check on the person and we don't use a social security number. So um, I, I think that there are a lot of different um, programs out there that folks could use and potentially hopefully some of them don't use social security numbers because otherwise how would we be able to do a background check without a social security number as attorneys. Okay, great. That is all of the questions that I see that have come in. So um, if anyone has not had a chance to type in their question in the chat, please do so now. I'm gonna do a last call here. <laughs> yeah. I don't see anything else coming in right now. So um, I think we probably will just go ahead and, and wrap up unless, Floor, did you have any last comments or, or thoughts that you wanted to share? No, no okay. just thank you. I appreciate your time. Great. Um, uh, like I said, we did record this session and we do hope to post it online afterwards so people can have the information that we shared. Um, great resources. Um, so many thanks to you, Floor, and, and thank you all for, for using your lunch hour to join us um, to uh, get this information. We appreciate everybody's participation. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. I'm going to log off now. Thank you so much.